Welcome all of our campuses to a brand new series. We're so excited about this series. Every week I wanna always welcome right at this service, the men and women that are joining us live from the Orleans Justice Center and the St. Tammany Parish Jail. Come on, let's just welcome all of our campuses. Man, so excited to have you guys. I am really fired up about this. We are beginning today a six-week series called Jesus Is. Can everybody say that with me? The count of three. One, two, three. Jesus Is. You know, it's interesting. A number of years ago, probably seven, eight years ago, I read a book by a great pastor in California, actually Seattle and California pastor, a couple of churches over there, uh, Judas Smith. And he wrote a book uh, called Jesus Is, which was somewhat of an inspiration for this series. Of course, you can get that, dive deeper in that. But I wanna talk to you over the next six weeks, all the way up to Easter. I wanna talk to you about Jesus. Matter of fact, I wanna talk to you about his traits. I wanna talk to you about his characteristics and his personality. It's hard for some people to actually imagine that, that, that Jesus actually had a personality. I want you to think about this. Oh, it's interesting as well. I want to note, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about who Jesus is, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot of misconceptions out there about who Jesus is. And the reason is, is that a lot of people figure out or they, they hear about Jesus from hearsay. Sometimes it's from paintings they may have seen in a museum. Sometimes it's from, well, my friend said this, or I heard this one time, or, or sometimes it's, it's, it's they, they, they've heard about Jesus from religion. My question is, did you hear about Jesus from the Bible? There's a lot of difference between Jesus and the Bible and what some people say about Jesus. You know, well, I think Jesus is kind of like this. Well, what does the Bible say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Are y'all with me? One of the things you'll always find about Church of the King is we always want to say, what does the Bible say? Can y'all just say that with me at the count of three? One, two, three. What does the Bible say? I'm not interested in my opinion. Quite honestly, I'm not interested in your opinion. I don't say that to be disrespectful. I want to know what the Bible says about Jesus. Listen, the Bible says a lot about Jesus. Matter of fact, every week we're going to be looking at a different trait, a different trait of who Jesus is. Paul the Apostle, one of my heroes, I I quote him all the time. And of course, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. You know, he was a brilliant man. He was very trained. He was intellectual. He was was just a brilliant orator. And he came into Corinth, and Corinth was a very sophisticated city, very intellectual city. And and, and he, he made a statement in the book of Corinthians that I think is important. Here's what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech. Now, that's important because, again, much of the Bible was written, particularly the New Testament, in a Greco-Roman world. The Greece was a highly sophisticated intellectual place, and, and they would have high levels of disputation and argumentation. And Paul said, listen, when I came to you guys, I, I didn't come, I didn't come to you with all this, 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 this high uh, ethereal intellectualism, but I, I, I boiled this thing down real simple. I came to you not with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. But let me tell you what I did. Verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know what cuts through all the philosophical arguments? You know what cuts through all the ethereal, uh, the wandering intellectual? It's, It's who is Jesus? Matter of fact, maybe you came here because you heard about Church of the King and maybe your friend invited you. And because you wanted to hear about, you know, we were doing a series and we're honored that you're here. We know that there's guests here every week at all of our campuses, whether it's Baton Rouge or Gulf Coast. Those of you that are in Metairie right now are online. We, we know that, that people come each week and particularly to a series like this. There's a lot of questions in our culture. Who is Jesus? What does he do? What does he mean? And what is this whole thing about it? What is Christianity about? Paul said... Paul said, I determined to not know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, it's interesting when you think about the name Jesus, and and I want to talk about that for a moment. Who is Jesus, and what is Jesus doing, and was he a real historical figure? By the way, we're going to talk about that. A lot of people just think, well, you know, the further we get away from when he actually walked on the earth is, was there really a man named Jesus today? I want to talk to you about a trait. Jesus, listen, Jesus is my best friend. The thought that Jesus can be our friend. 
Now, I don't know if you guys growing up had a best friend. I know as, you're, as an adult, you usually don't use that language, but, 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 but I had, and I've got some real dear friends today, but I had a best friend growing up. His name was Rob. And there's people in our church today, as a matter of fact, a number of our campuses, and they knew me growing up. And, and so it was kind of like Rob and I, and, and, and the, the question was never, you know, who else was going to hang out. It was always Rob and I, and then, then we would include people. And, and so I, I, I had, for a number of years, a, a best friend growing up. What's interesting is, particularly with guys, and I want to say this because I am one, guys nickname their friends. Isn't that right? I mean that. I mean, guys, will, you know, they'll walk up. You, you, you see and overhear a bunch of guys talking. They nickname their friends. They'll walk up. I mean, for example, ladies, you won't go up to one of your friends and go, what's up, big woman? <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, would y'all say that? No, you don't say that. But guys, we, we would say that. Isn't that right, guys? We go, what's up, big guy? You know, what's up? I mean, ladies, you actually call people by their names. Matter of fact, in my family, I've given everybody a nickname, and as they get older, their nicknames changes. Come on, Dad, isn't that right? I mean, but moms, we, they don't nickname their kids. I, I nickname everybody. Everybody's got a nickname, and, and it's, it's interesting, you know, if, if four ladies go out, you know, whatever their names are, they're going to call their friends those names throughout the lunch. But if four guys go out, doesn't matter what their names are. By the end, you know, it's like, what's up, Superman? What's up, Snappy? What's up? You know, it's just whatever. Godzilla. I mean, just whatever. Stinky. I mean, you're going to name your friends. It's just, it's just, it's just. And by the way, growing up, I had a nickname. And I, I tell you what my nickname was. I, I, I was real skinny. And I, I know you can't imagine that because I'm very strong and powerful now. <laughs> but when I was growing up, I was super skinny and I couldn't gain weight. I couldn't do anything to gain weight. So I played football and going into seventh grade, I played at John Curtis and, you know, it's the best football school in America. And, and so when, you, when you're in seventh grade, your spring year, you actually start training. In eighth grade, you play football with the seniors. And of course, you're, you know, they run you over and stuff. But so, they, so there was two seniors and if I name one of the names, you guys would, would, would know one of his names. A lot of people would in our, in our area. And they nicknamed me, ready for this? Flea. How many of you know it's hard to have a good self-image when you're nicknamed? I'm just saying. So, so my nickname, to this day, to this day, I'm 51. These guys would probably be 54. 5, 56, because they were seeing this. To this day, if I see them. Here's the thing about nicknames. You often forget the name. If you use a nickname long enough, it's like, you know, I, you, know you want to say, my name's Steve no, Fleet. And so for years, we're talking 35 years, you know how interesting that is. So you have a name and they have a nickname. Did, did you know that Jesus, he has a name, a proper name, but he also had a nickname. I want to read something about Jesus. This is going to be a fun series, by the way. Matthew chapter 121, listen to this. All right, a given name, his given name. And she, Mary, will bring forth a son, and you shall call his, what, everybody say it? Name, what, say it? Jesus. So that's his proper given name, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, you may not know this, but the name Jesus actually was a common name in that culture. And so it's interesting today, and I said it's very respectfully, the name Jesus is still used, particularly in the Hispanic culture. You go to work, I mean, you go to a Mexican restaurant, your waiter, I mean, there's an opportunity, he could be called Jesus. He comes up and, you know, and of course I know it's Jesus, I get it. You know, it's funny. I remember one time with my, my boys going, you know, dad, get, get Jesus over here. We need more, you know, cheese sauce, you know, he going back and forth. So I get it. I get it. I, I understand that. But so, so in that, in the Hispanic culture, it's na today, in the same thing in Bible culture, Jesus, it was a common name. And the name Jesus actually means, it means to, <clears throat> to, to his proper name, to save people. It's to, it's, to, it's to save people from their sins, the name Jesus. Now, interestingly, he had a nickname. The longer that his nickname is used, and you'll see this in the Gospels, you begin to understand this, People begin to grasp this. It wasn't his name that really was revolutionary. It was his nickname. Look at verse 23. Behold, 
the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his, what? Say it, name. What's the next word? Emmanuel, which is translated, what? Say it, God with us. His proper name is Jesus. By the way, I had one other thing. His assignment was he was the Christ. So he's got a proper name, Jesus. His assignment was he was the anointed Messiah, but his nickname was Emmanuel, which means what? Say it, God with us. People didn't call him Emmanuel. That was his nickname in the sense of, and by the way, your nickname is often attached to something that you do. It's like you've got, you play on a basketball team and the kid's name is Sam. And, and you call him Hoops because he makes three points or two points. What's up, Hoops? And, and the fact is, is that Emmanuel is, is, is something <clears throat> that he did. His name is Jesus. He saved people from their sins. But, but Emmanuel is a different concept. The Jewish people knew a Savior was coming. There was a Savior. The Messiah. But this concept of God with us, this was revolutionary. The reason why it was revolutionary is because Jewish people throughout the Old Testament, they, um, they have this concept that God, I want everyone to hear me, this is important. God is, and this is where some people may be, right here. God is up there. God is big, which he is. God's the creator, which Jewish people believe and believe then. But this concept of God being with us, that was revolutionary. With us. No, no, no. God is, you ever hear these big terms, the imminence of God, the transcendence of God. God is above space. He's above But this imminence concept is, is that he, is that, is that he, he somehow comes close to us. How can the creator come close? Well, his name is Emmanuel. God, finish it with me, finish it with me. God with us. Stories told of a little boy who was in a real bad thunderstorm. You, you guys know that we have, met. my gosh, bad thunderstorms sometimes down here in the Gulf Coast. And it's interesting, this little boy was really freaked out. And, and you know when those, th I mean, they could be like a half mile away, but these lightning, these start striking. It's like, my gosh, it's going to hit my house. It's right outside my window. So he calls for his mom. He says, mom, mom, come in here. Of course, the mom comes in and rushes in and talks to her little son and, 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 and encourages him because he's scared because he's hearing all this crazy stuff. Bam, bam, outside. And, and the mom says, and they're Christian fans, and mom says, well, honey, let's pray to Jesus and, 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 and let's just pray that and God's going to give you peace and God's going to protect us and you'll be able to go to sleep. So she prays with him. God's with you, son. So she goes back to her room. Sure enough, the lightning starts again. Bam. Bam, bam. He goes, Mom, Mom. And Mom goes, Mom, I, I, know, I know God's with me, I guess, but I, I just, would you mind sleeping in the bed with me? Because I just need God with skin on right now. <laughs> the Jewish people, they knew that God was up there, but let me tell you who Jesus was. Jesus was God with skin on. Yeah. Everybody say, Emmanuel. God with us. When we talk about Jesus, we have to understand what his proper name is, but we also have to understand what his nickname was. Is because, because, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to press you guys a little bit, all right? I'm going to push you a little bit because I don't want to serve a God that doesn't get me. I, I don't want to serve, this isn't the Wizard of Oz where, you know, like the guy's behind the strings and, and you know, there's this, and all these big, no, no, no. What's so different between Christianity, biblical Christianity, in every other world religion? Is it every other world religion? You gotta, you know, kneel on glass and flagellate yourself or go on these pilgrimages to somehow, somehow get right with this big God up there that's kind of other than us and doesn't get. But, but biblical Christianity is not us trying to reach God up there. It's actually God came down to reach us here. It's different. Well, that's what the book of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 17, therefore in all things, everyone say all things. In all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Wow. 
that he might be a merciful and a high priest. You ever have a conversation with somebody and you've gone through something and they've really not gone through that and they're trying to be compassionate with you and you're thinking to yourself, you really don't get me. Conversely, you ever have a conversation with somebody and and you're sharing something that you've gone through and they have gone through that and you know that they know and they know that you know that they get you? He's a merciful and a faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God. He paid a payment for the sins of his people for that and he himself has suffered. He has suffered. Christ suffered. We talk a lot about, listen, the humanity of Christ or the divinity of Christ, but there he was 100% God, but he's also 100% man. It's called the hypostatic union. He's the son of God, but he's also the son of man. He was fully God, fully man. Wow. I remember years ago, probably in the late 80s, you guys remember that movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, and just a perversion of truth. By the way, we don't get understanding of who Christ is from unregenerate Hollywood directors. Are you with me? Ooh, this pastor's rough. No, I'm just biblical. I'm not gonna let some guy in Hollywood tell me what Jesus is like. I'm gonna look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if it doesn't line up with this, you're just making up a fairy tale. Hold on one second. That's good preaching, pastor. That's really good preaching. You guys remember that? You know, he's having affairs in the movie and all these different, and now there's shows. I mean, I mean the, 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 it's just so twisted. How about let's go into the source? Let's go to the source of who Christ is like. The fact of the matter is he's not some distant God that doesn't get you, sir. He's not some distant God, ma'am, that doesn't get you. He actually gets us. He understands us. Why? Because he's 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And he was tempted in all ways, in all things, yet without sin. In other words, because he didn't give in to the temptation, he can empower you and embolden you and strengthen you to be able to walk through that. He gets you, and he gets me. He understands what we're going through. I want to talk to you today about three things that Jesus understands. This is my introduction. Every week we're going to build upon this. I promise you, if you'll stay with me over the next six weeks, I promise you, I promise you, your understanding of Christ. Pastor, why are you teaching for six weeks on Jesus? Because the more that you know about Jesus, the more that you can love Jesus. Come on, the more that you know about Jesus is the more that you can love Jesus. Let me give you three things that he understands. Number one, he understands relationships. Now, I'm gonna share something with you guys. I was walking out last night and this guy said to me, he said, Pastor, I never even knew that about Jesus. Here it is, you guys ready? Pastor, why does he understand relationships? Mark chapter six, verse three. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Remember, Jesus was a carpenter following in the footsteps of his stepfather, Joseph. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of, he had four brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon are not his sisters here with us as well. That's the only place in scripture where we actually get the names of Jesus as I'll call them half brothers and sisters. So he had four brothers and he had two sisters. Now, let me say this, and I want everybody to hear me at all of our campuses. Could you imagine, listen, could you imagine growing up in the house with Jesus? My brother, man, he was so smart. I mean, I had to work hard in school. Anybody had a sibling like that? It's like, you know, I got to study for three days. I mean, Keith, you know, he just, he's just smart. Some people are like, how would you like to be compared? How would you like to be compared with Jesus? And let me just say this. I've, I've got four children, and, and, and this is seven children. Some of you have more children. So, so you know that things are happening in the house. And by the way, Jesus didn't do any miracles until he was anointed by the Holy Spirit at 30. He wasn't 12 years old. I didn't study for my English test. God, give it to me. I mean, in other words, he, he, are you, that would be cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> there it is. No, yeah, he was, he's a, he was a human being in the house. Yes, without sin, but, but could you imagine being compared with Jesus? You know, if Jesus made his bed, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Jesus never gets in trouble, so what? I mean, I mean, I, it was just kind of, um, you know, you know, G, you know, the, you know, we had a shower, you know, one shower. My brother and I shared, you know, and of course, this kids, you know, you're not gonna. I need to get in the shower. You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine Jesus just, you know, he just everything? Could you imagine being compared with Jesus in your house? Wow. Jesus gets it. He gets relationships. He understands relationships. By the way, by the way, you know that the scripture says a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. In other words, listen to me, listen to me. It's often hard to grow up where you grew up. It's hard because, because why? Because people know you. Are you with me? It's like when I meet people still in the community, I'm 50 years old. It's like, Steve, are you a pastor? I didn't know you were a Christian. I'm like, well, you know, this kind of happened a little while ago, you know. Can you imagine? So he gets it. Are y'all listen, listen? And let me tell you something. And listen, I want everybody to hear me. Sometimes the greatest pains we can experience are in our actual home. I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Pastor, huh? time out, time out. He doesn't get everything. Let me tell you why. Because Jesus wasn't married. <laughs> so like everything else is fake until you do that, you know. Because it's like, oh. Gosh, when you're married, you know, I mean, once you say I do, I mean, there it is. Well, time out, time out, time out. Let me get you theologically. What was Jesus, one of the terms that Jesus is referred to in the Bible? He's called the bride, he's called the bride groom. So he's married to the church. How I many know oh, that's, that's a lot of it's a lot going on there? Are y'all with me? Are y'all with me? So he understands siblings. He understands a lot of, you know, oh, I'm sorry, and let's prefer it. And, and hey, at this time at Christmas, oh, we'll go here. And we went out at Easter and time out. Mom, everybody, well, he, he understands all that. And bathroom, and hey, I need to use it, and all that. And he understands. He, uh, but, but he also, he also, he also understands friendship. And he also understands betrayal and friendship. Can you imagine giving himself, can you imagine for 12, listen, for three years, you pour into 12 people. 12 people for three years, three years. Hang out with them, do miracles, amazing stuff. And right at the end, in the hour of your need, watch this, one of them sells you for 30 pieces of silver, all right? All right. 10 of them split, actually nine of them split. One of them denies you, that's Peter, you're sold by one. You're denied by... Only John shows up at the cross. Can you imagine? You ever been through a tough time in your life? Of course you have. And one of the things that helps you get through those tough times is a friend is there with you. But, how about Jesus? He's hanging on the cross and there's just John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and a couple of her friends. Can you imagine going through it? So he gets it. He understands relationships. He understands the pain. He understands growing up. He understands siblings. Yeah. Number one, Jesus gets you. Number two, he also not only understands relationships, he understands life. He understands life. Everyday life. He understands what you and I are going through on our jobs. All right, so here's how it works in the Jewish culture. At 12 years old, at 12 years old, a Jewish man, a young man would step into manhood. There would be a ceremony similar to a bar mitzvah today. And, and, and what he would do is he would take on the profession and the vocation of his father. Of course, we know that Joseph was his stepfather. God the Father impregnated Mary. We understand that. We believe that. But here's the point. Do you know that for 18 years, Jesus was a carpenter? Now think about that for a moment. He worked. He was a worker. He had calluses on his hands and he was a hard worker and he had to deal with irate customers. Well, that's not what I wanted. And, and you, no, 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 no. We paid you for this and you built something different. And, 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 and I know that you spent a year building this, but we want to return it. Return it. You want me to do it all over again? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Jesus understands work. You know, I understood work growing up. My mom, Cajun, of course, you work. You just do, you work. I used, I mean, everything, I, I just, just, my mom just, principal, she make every, work. I had a job when I was 12. They used to drop me off at Mr. Clean Car Wash when I was 14. 
work every week. You just work. You just work. You couldn't take naps as a kid. You got to work. That's what you do. You work. You just work. You don't get sick. Sickness is weak. Get, just go to work. I'm not, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I mean, I always had to work. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, of course, I've, you know, see a lot of counselors today. But apart from that, I'm just, I'm just, but apart from that, I've got a good work ethic. I thank God that I serve a God that understands work. He understands what it's like to deal with people. You ever thought about this for a moment? You ever thought about when you're praying to Jesus, God's up there? And, and here's the prayer thing. We're going into 21 days of prayer, by the way. It's not that we're only going to pray 21 days. Day 22, no more prayer. No, this is a concentrated time of prayer. Are you all with me? And I love what the pastor, pastor Doug at the Little Creek campus, I just want everybody to hear me. Prayer and fasting is not, we're not starving ourselves so God will be happy with us. Are y'all with me? We're temporarily saying no to some things, whatever they are, all right, so that we can say yes to God so we can have more of God. Does that make sense? So, but this is important. I want everybody to hear me. Sometimes when we pray, we go to God that God is just up there and he's so big and our picture of God is not in his humanity. When you talk to somebody that's gone through what you've gone through and understands, I'm telling you, you have a different perspective. Try to picture Jesus in his humanity when you pray. Is this new for you? Try to picture Try to picture him in, in his humanity, how he talks to you, what he's been through, what he understands about us. He was, he probably wear blue jeans and a t-shirt and who knows and a tool belt and all, all, of, all of you that are in construction. Let me just tell you something, Jesus was just like him. I do want to say one other thing and I, and I can say this, I can say this. Again, paintings often gives us an illusion of what Je Jesus did not have blonde hair and fair skin. It was not from Northern Europe. I know this is going to hurt some of y'all's feelings, but he didn't look like me. He was Middle Easterner. Are, are you with me? You ever go to those paintings? You know, you're in Europe. You're like, uh, of course, you, they, they're, they're painting it from their perspective, right? No, no, no. Jesus, Jesus was a Middle Easterner. And, 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 he, and he was a worker. And why is it so important? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. We do not have a God that doesn't get us. We do not have a God. We do, we, we, do, we do not walk with a God that does not get our human dilemma. We have a God that became one of us. Everybody say Jesus. Say Emmanuel. God with us. Let me give you the third and final thing. He understands our pain. So he understands relationships. He understands our everyday concerns professionally, our work. He gets us. He's done it. 18 years. But he also understands human pain. Isaiah chapter 53, 3 says, He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Grief is the word pain in the Hebrew. Let me just say this. You guys remember this. We, we grew up as kids in here. The sticks and stones may what? But words will never what? The truth is emotional pain is sometimes much more severe than physical pain. Physical pain abates. It, 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 it lessens over time. I know some of you maybe have chronic pain physically, but, but the overwhelming majority of people are not going to have a lifetime chronic pain situation. <clears throat> Everybody is going to have the opportunity to feel emotional pain. And the reality is, is that Jesus experience the emotional pain, the rejection, the ridicule. He is despised and rejected by men. Why would they reject him? The very Jewish people, uh, uh, we, we're going to come, we're going to come in our, in our series. We're going to come right up to Palm Sunday, the week before Easter. <clears throat> and I'm going to be teaching about Christ. And I think that last message is Christ is coming again. And, and, and the very people that, that, that raised the palm branches in Hosanna, y'all remember that? And he's riding on a donkey down the Mount of Olives coming into Jerusalem. The very people that declared Hosanna, Hosanna, which means praise the Lord, hallelujah to the Lord. In the beginning of the week, at the end of the week, when Pontius Pilate gave them an opportunity do you release Barabbas or him? The very same people are saying, what? Crucify him. 
Don't tell me he didn't experience pain. You ever felt, have you ever been betrayed by like that before? Experience pain and rejection? That's rejection. And can you imagine he's dying before the whole world and they're cursing and mocking and spitting on him and he's actually doing it for them and for us. <clears throat> and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. It goes on, it says, he was despised and rejected by, by men. I want to dedicate this next moment to the young people. I, I, I became a Christian when I was 19 years old. I was a freshman in college. And I want to say this. I know it's Mardi Gras. Some kids are in, some are out. I, I think everybody's probably back at school. But So if our, we have college, a lot of college students up at our Baton Rouge campus watching this as well and, and all of our campus. I want to say this. I want to say this. Jesus understands the rejection of what it's like with his peers. And I know when you start serving Christ, sometimes in high school or sometimes in college, it's like, what are you doing, man? You're becoming religious religious time out time out you're loving Jesus and when you feel rejected he'll listen he'll not only heal you but he'll love you and he'll empower you to be able to overcome that rejection and become the man or woman that God created you to be you need to know that you need to know that I'll never forget right after I became a Christian I, met, I had some friends from from the world who said oh you know Steve like did you like find religion or what happened to you like did you did you become one of the no no, no. I said I became a Christian I love God I'm not doing the stuff that we did any I'm not I'm not going back to that anymore and I remember the mocking some of you guys experienced that you guys remember some of you guys remember what it was like to be the first person your family saved give your heart to Christ and, and now all your cousins everybody's like now like what like 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 we all like we all kind of know God and like what happened to you? It's painful. Yeah. Jesus qualifies to be our best friend because he's a God that loves us, a God that cares about us. He 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 doesn't judge us. He doesn't he's not against us. He's for us. He he died for us. He loves us, but he suffered for us. I'll close with this. I'm not a social media guy. We've got a lot of younger people on our staff. Pastor, you've got to get on Instagram. You've got to do Facebook. You need to do it at least before you like go to heaven. And so they're telling me like, you don't, you don't understand. You know, people want to know and they want to, they, you know, they want to know what you ate for breakfast. That's a big deal. <laughs> really? And so I'm really, I'm getting this pressure because they're like, you need to be cooler you know, you need to be hipper. You need, you need to get in touch. So I'm, 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 I'm praying about it. Matter of fact, I'm making it a prayer point for my 21 day. I'm just joking. I, I'm teasing. I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm God, I shouldn't say that. But. So I'm not fully conversant and aware of all the issues related to and all the, the traits and things related to Facebook. But I, but I do know that you can have a BFF or something. You can, you know, I, I want to say this. I want to say this. You know what a BFF is? A best friend forever? Listen. Do you know that when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he actually becomes your BFF? Just think about that for a moment. I know some of y'all may think that's cheesy because you like to keep God in a relationship that he's way up there, but that's not biblical Christianity. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And he wants to come near. He wants to come close to you. I grew up, and I'll say this and I'll close. I remember growing up with this concept, and I remember hearing this. I want to expose something. I understand the truth side of it is, but I also think there's more damage to it than truth. All right, I want everybody to hear what I'm about to say. Everybody at all of our campuses, here's my last comment, and we're going to pray. I understand, and I know when people say this to me, what their intention is. You just need to serve the Lord. I want everybody to hear me. When you become a Christian, you don't become a servant of the Lord. You actually become a friend of Jesus. Angels serve the Lord. We have a relationship with God. Listen, angels, they're not just flying around in heaven, fat little Gerber babies feeding people grapes as they come through the pearly gates. I understand what it means to serve the Lord. I get that concept. But I think a better concept is John 15, I'll close. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But now I've called you what? Everybody say it. 
you can be a friend of God. You can talk to God. You can talk to Jesus. You can pour your heart out to Jesus. You know, a good friend. Let me tell you, let me tell you when you know you got a good friend. You guys ready? Here it is. I'll, let me tell you when you know you got a good friend. You can say whatever you want or you don't have to say anything. It doesn't affect the relationship. You can be a friend. For all things I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. There's an invitation waiting that we can, we can be a friend, a friend to Jesus. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads at every one of our campuses. I'm going to ask our campus pastors to come on stage. This is the first message. I'm so excited about this series, but I just think it's appropriate right now before we go any further. Maybe you do not know Jesus. Again, I say this respectfully. Maybe you've heard about Jesus, obviously, from living maybe in America. I know we have people that join us Facebook Live and online around the world, but, 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 but everybody's heard of the man or a name Jesus. But do, the question I have is, do you know him personally? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Do you talk to him? Do you walk with him? You can. Here's what the Bible says. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. You have to first recognize your need for God. And that's the first step. That's where some people get hung up. They, 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 they won't humble themselves and recognize their spiritual need for God. When I was 19 years old, I came to that place where I recognized I was spiritually empty. And I, and I said, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me, cleanse me, make me new. And, and I came into a relationship with Jesus. My question is, do you know Christ? Do you know that you know if you die today, you're ready to stand before God? With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, if you say, Pastor, pray for me, I need Jesus. I'm not sure about my relationship with God. I'm not sure where I am spiritually. And I want things to be right between me and God. If that's you, at the count of three, would you just lift your hand up high so I can see it? Pastor, I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me, and to make me new. If that's you, one, two, three.